What's going on, everyone? Welcome to a Movie Emporium spoiler discussion of the first four episodes of Ryan Johnson's Poker Phase, the series that he has created for Peacock's uh, streaming service. Okay, so I've been really excited for this series since I learned about it uh, like about a month or two ago. Um, the reason for that is, of course, is Ryan Johnson. I love Ryan Johnson. I think he's a fantastic creator. He knows how to create good mysteries. He knows how to just write really good scripts. And... The fact that he's doing a TV show is nothing new because he's done TV in the past with stuff like Breaking Bad. Of course, he did some of the best Breaking Bad episodes, at least directed them. And so when we come to a series that he's created that's his own, you got to be a little excited because stuff like Knives Out, stuff like Looper, stuff like, you know, Brick and stuff like that. He's a he's an he's a director that just knows what he's doing, and on top of that, he's brought in a really good cast for this series. You know, he brought back he's brought back Adrian Brody. Of course, they worked with on the Brothers Bloom. He of course has Natasha Lyonne as the main actress in this movie, or I'm sorry, in the actress in this show. And of course, she is known for like Russian Doll, Orange Is the New Black, American Pie. She's a very talented actress that has a, has been given a lot of you know, credence for the amount of years that she's worked in Hollywood and now she's kind of made it in her own and it's kind of nice to see her kind of shepherd another show on her own as kind of the main protagonist for this kind of like uh, week by week mystery series with a lot of famous actors in its own right. So what I wanted to do is I usually do, I'm going to do episode by episode, but because there's four episodes, this might be a little bit of a longer video. It might take a little bit longer to explain, but I'm not going to go into like all the details of the show because I'm sure you've watched it already. I just want to go into like the main concepts of what they're doing and why I think it's a really clever show. Even though some of the some of the episodes are better than others, at least in the first four episodes that I've seen, but I think this is a show that, uh, for the most part, if I if I were to give it an honest score, it would be like a eight out eight out of ten because I think it's a really well handled show with some really interesting di uh, dynamics and dichotomy when it comes to how the show is structured and once again feels like a Ryan Johnson show, a Ryan Johnson property, just with how it's structured. So if you've seen Glass Onion and Knives Out. Where you see knives out, you see how those how those movies are kind of structured when it comes to like how everything is explained, what the details are given to you as the movie moves along, and then when it finally gets to its halfway point or wherever point it gets to, that's what the show is doing, which is really clever. I really like the fact that he's taking that structure and kind of allowing it to have its really interesting values and kind of pressing forward and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed that. I really think that's a lot of fun. And like I said, the first four episodes have now released. There are going to be, I think, 10 episodes, and they're going to release week by week after that. So that's a really cool thing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about the first episode, which is called Dead Man's Hand. And what's really cool about this episode, uh, directed and written by Ryan Johnson, because he's the creator of the show, he has he pretty much does the first pilot and stuff like that, is a lot of these shows already has the protagonist. They, you already know, they already have a set history. They're kind of brought in to do, you know, the mystery product and stuff like that, or the project. And you know, this episode is actually the introduction to the whole entire world through an episode that does the same structure as every other episode. But what's really nice is we get like all the good, good info about Natasha Leone's Charlie character and how she kind of sets up in this world. And what I really like is it, what's really cool, I guess you could say, and what the, the most interesting thing is. It starts out with Dasha Polanco's Natalie character as she's uh, she works at a hotel called Frost uh, Hotel or whatever. It's like a Vegas like casino that's run by the character who play, is played by Adrian Brody, who plays Steve Frost Jr. And basically what happens is she goes into her room. She sees something on the computer. She takes a picture. She takes it to Adrian Brody and Benjamin Bratt, who's like the head of security. And they play off like, you know, everything's going to be fine. You know, this is the basically they're made, they're playing her for a fool. And we find out later on that they end up killing her and her husband or boyfriend that we you know learn is kind of an abusive boyfriend. And basically, it leads what it ends up happening is all this is happening. She finds a picture which we f I think we find out is actually a child pornography of like a high roller suite individual, somebody who's very wealthy. 
And that's really important because there's a lot of um, stuff that Ryan Johnson's throwing out there about the mega rich and, you know, the ideas of like what they can get away with and what they can't get away with and what people are doing willing to do to protect them. There is a lot of symbolism and a lot of ideologies behind stuff that might not make people very uncomfortable, but that's what this series is doing is it's taking like real world scenarios in the sense of like what people are willing and able to get away with and giving the opportunity to somebody like, you know, Natasha Lone's Charlie character, the ability to solve and kind of put out there to the police and kind of expose this wider problem. But anyways, Charlie, we find out is actually good friends with Natalie. And the cool thing about this series is it actually, f the whole portion that we see for like 10 to 15 minutes is actually flashbacked to the point where we see Natalie and Charlie who, like I said, are friends, traveling to the hotel. So we basically saw a good portion of this episode where the incident is eventually going to take place. We find out Charlie is basically a cocktail waitress, but she's also because she has history with Steve Frost Jr.'s father. She, in the process of everything, uh, is offered a job by Steve Frost Jr., the Adrian Brody character, to basically take down the individual that Natalie's character saw up in the suite that had the picture of the child pornography and stuff like that. And basically, they want to swindle him out of money because he's running his own poker game. And the nice thing that kind of sets up Charlie's character is she's very good at telling lies of people. Therefore, she can read people. She can tell they're telling the truth. All that good stuff. It plays out later on. But what... What is really cool about this whole scenario, what makes this episode so interesting, is Adrian Brody thinks he's smart. He thinks he's like the, he, he can get away with everything, that he was able to hide the fact that he, you know, he killed the, the, the Polanco character, the Natalie character. But as we see through this episode and how it plays out, they're trying to deflect everything, but there are pieces and puzzles of like, you know, for instance, uh, every time Adrian Brody answers the phone, every time, you know, she, you know, stuff starts happening with Natalie's character and that whole situation, how it feels so odd that, you know, they're handling this situation and Charlie starts to uncover and see some really kind of interesting, uh, like kind of really off material when it comes to these two characters about, you know, the phone situation and why are they so, you know, why are they so like pushing forward to this like poker game that they want to swindle this rich guy from to the iPad that's found. And, you know, now he's a part of our house with the deleted photo that actually the Adrian Brody, C. Frost character deleted just everything that starts playing out. Charlie starts to, uh, or she starts to basically uncover. And because she's so good at telling, you know, telling the lie or seeing the lies off people's faces, she starts to realize and she starts to kind of put together that these two individuals, Benjamin Bratt, who's a, a head of security, and of course, Adrian Brody, who runs this hotel with his father, were they're covering up the murder that they created because Natalie found the picture. But they are basically been doing this a long time and they want to swindle this guy out of money. And she finds it kind of odd that they're not really worried about this woman getting killed and that at some point she can figure out that Natalie brought the photo to the individuals because she found it in the room. Therefore she can kind of deduct and, you know, tell the police who we actually uh, see is played by Noah Segan, who of course is uh, Ryan Johnson's good friend, which is, it's a really funny scene where she's like kind of met, uh, Charlie's kind of messing stuff with stuff on the desk. And then Noah's, Noah's character is like, don't, don't mess with that. And he's like, if you have any problems or questions, give me a call. And that's what plays out later. There's a lot of, in these four episodes, I'm assuming the last of the episodes where the police show up at the end of the episode, like a, we, we officially got the bad guy type of situation. And after everything said and done, she confronts, you know, the Adrian Brody character, the Benjamin Bratt character says, I know what you did. I have proof. I can expose you for what you are. She's worried about getting fired because she has some history with the father of Adrian Brody's character. And after everything's exposed, after, you know, it's going down, you know, now, now that Steve Frost is going to be arrested and so on and so forth, uh, Steve's character jumps out the window in a very disturbing <laughs> suicide fashion where we see him actually get on top of the railing, jump off the side of the building and fall to the ground. We don't see him hit the ground, but we see him falling to the ground, which is not a very good CGI effect, but it's a, it's a very effective scene. And that's when we have our main crux storyline where... Basically, Charlie has to go on the run. 
uh, the father of C. Frost, who now has lost his son, is like, "You're dead. I'm going. Never going. I'm never going to stop finding you or trying to find you." He sends uh, the character that Benjamin Bratt plays, who's the kind of fixer slash head of security, and that's where the episode ends. The police come. He, she's on the run, and it's a good setup for the what the series is eventually going to be, which is her on the run, but getting involved with these crazy mysteries, which it, it might lead into its own problem in its own right. Because you know, as you'll see in these like the first four episodes, she seems to be in the right place or the wrong place at the wrong time because there's always a murder. She seems to be involved in a very a personal manner, and it's not very what do I call. Uh, not very like logical in a lot of respects because I, I know these series, you know, if you look at like, you know, Matlock or Columbo, they seem to be at the, it's just, it's funny how they seem to be at that moment at that time when it comes to, you know, the place and time of just the murder or stuff like that. So it's just very convenient storytelling. But with a series like this, you come to expect it. But with this first episode, it's a really good start, a really good, you know, kind of, look into what charlie's capable of as an actor or not as an actor but as a character and what natalie and uh, natasha leone brings to the table which is it's very much natasha leone doing natasha leone but she's an actress that is very unique and very interesting to watch and you see that here so therefore it's it's a good episode it's a well-written episode it's a fun episode i think it's one of the better of the four episodes to be fairly honest i would put it like right below the third episode but for the time being Dead Man's Hand is a great start to a series that I think is going to be a lot of fun going going forward. And so with that said, I'll give it a, you know, a eight and a half out of 10 because I do have problems with some of the convenience of the plotting and just the ideas of what the story is doing and how it's working. So therefore, it is a little, the logistics are a little too simple for what I like, but for the most part, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. But it is a, still a very entertaining story for the first pilot episode of Poker Phase. So uh, with that said, that is uh, episode one. And so we'll go ahead and head into episode two. Now, the nice thing about what Ryan Johnson is able to do now as a director and writer and creator, he's, he's able to bring in actors and actresses that have clout, that have ability to act. They're capable of doing the job properly because, you know, when you start out in Hollywood or whatever... Sometimes you don't get like the actors and actresses you want. A lot of times you get lucky, you know, Joseph Gordon Levitt, who's a been working with Ryan Johnson for many, many years, of course, worked with him in Brick and stuff like that. So it does work. But this episode is interesting because not only did Ryan Johnson just get nominated for an Oscar for uh, Glass Onion, but this is an episode that also features a first time Oscar nominated actress for The Whale, Hong Chow, which I thought was kind of cool. But this episode is called The Night Shift. It's once again written uh, and directed by Ryan Johnson, written, also co-written by Alice Jew. It's an episode that I don't know. I, I would call this episode a little convenient for its own for its own good. It's not a terrible episode, but it's not what I would call the best written episode of the four um, just because the character that is the main antagonist of this episode is really sloppily written and really, really sloppily directed. Uh, it's played by Colton Ryan who plays Jed. And basically what this is, is a, a stalkerish episode about a kid or a young person who works for, I don't know if it's for his father or his brother or just a friend who's played by John Ratzenberger who plays Abe, and he works at this uh, auto body shop, I guess you could say. And we have these three characters. We had Jed, we have Brandon Michael Hall, who plays the subway uh, store worker, who is the one that is the murder suspect, or not murder suspect, he's the one that gets murdered. And then we have Megan Suri, who plays the, the convenience store clerk or whatever that the Jed character is in love with. And basically the setup is Jed's in love with this Megan Suri character who works at the convenience store, of course, Brandon Michael Hall is a character who is very um, uh, aff affable. He's very just. He's a very good person. Uh, I think he was in the military. He's going into the military, but he basically every night goes to uh, the convenience store, gets a lottery ticket, gets her a sub and stuff like that. The two Jed and the Brandon Michael Hall character, uh, Damien, I think is his name. They end up having a conversation on the roof, which is where he's trying to calm down this Jed character. In the simple fact of like you're what you're doing is wrong and what you're doing is gonna get you in trouble and maybe maybe you need to rethink your life. It's a very good like uh, way to tell 
to people that maybe you're stuck in a rut, maybe you need to do something better with your life. And, you know, it's good for a message and stuff like that. But basically, Brandon Michael Hall character basically scratches off the lottery ticket and wins $25,000. And it's pushed off the roof by this Jed character. And in the process, Jed, uh, he beats the guy with a hammer or beats the guy with a crowbar or whatever, kills him. And in some weird fashion, there's cameras everywhere. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. He takes the body, wraps it in this, like, cloth or whatever that is over this car and takes it and put in the puts in the truck of what we find out later is the hong chow character uh truck and frames the, the the trucker and stuff like that and then tries to you know cover up his tracks and stuff like that he puts the the apron that uh, the damien character wears back on the the thing at subway which is really strange. You think, oh, well, they, they actually make a joke of it like later that the camera is not real and stuff like that. So it still doesn't make any sense because Subway would always have cameras. So he would have been exposed either way. But he uses, the, he has the knife, which he got cut earlier. He puts it back on, he washes it, puts it back on the, the Subway knife back on the Subway board. And of course, like this story in this, the series is structured. All this stuff happens after Charlie... Uh, basically her car breaks down, which is the car that we have seen earlier in the episode that is basically underneath the, the sheet or whatever that, uh, Jed uses to hide the body. And it basically becomes down to a story of just like a really stupid murder, uh, trying to hide his tracks and trying to be really smart. But once again, Jed looks like a murderer. He looks like a guy who would kill somebody. So it's like, it's like almost really convenient. And I, I understand, like, the, the idea of the murderer is always somebody you know. But the, the story that Charlie's uncovers with, you know, she finds all the evidence. She, you know, her car breaks down and she's, like, worried because if she uses ATM, blah, 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 blah. She's going to basically have her car fixed. It's going to cost her $400. There is some fun moments in, like, the diner where we come across, you know, Charlie's character, meaning the Hong Chao character. They have a discussion. This is where we get a, a really cool thing where Charlie basically learns about super glue and how it can fix up wounds and stuff like that, which we see actually later on in the fourth episode. And in the process, they kind of become friends. And so when Hong Chao's character is uh, un, um, basically falsely convicted of the, or basically falsely arrested for this murder that she finds in her truck, and she does a stupid thing instead of calling. The police, she hides the body. She tries to hide the body on the side of the road. But it, it's it's pretty standard. I mean, the stuff that it just kind of... I guess the episode kind of shows you that the people who think they're clever, especially murderers who think they're clever, are always going to get caught. They're going to get caught in the stupidest ways, which the kind of sign was uh, Charlie's character finds a bottle cap in the uh, apron of the subway shirt, and she figures out by climbing up the roof, seeing all these bottle caps that... She knows that he was involved with this. And on top of that, he's just a really creepy individual. And then the lottery ticket kind of gives it away because he claims he buys some lottery tickets. and He claims one of those lottery tickets was the one that won the ticket or won the $25,000. But it's revealed that, you know, that, that the ticket is not in the right sequential order. I can't pronounce that word, apparently. But with the help of the truckers and her ability to find the trucker, because she finds a, a, that each trucker's uh, truck has a dash cam that can record footage. So therefore, one of the truckers has she has footage of the uh, of the kid Jed putting the, uh, the body in the truck. And so therefore, uh, once he figures out that he's done, he goes up on the roof and waits for the cops and stuff like that. Which is surprised he didn't throw himself off the roof. But you know, on top of everything, his his like father figure, father, whatever, Abe's character, John Ratzenberger is like, you cut the line of the car. He's like, well, she was going to, she was trying to frame me for something I didn't do. And he, he kind of knows that Abe knows that he did something. And that's kind of where the episode ends. It ends with Charlie, uh, able to get Hong Chao out of uh, prison and stuff like that. And therefore that's the end of the episode. And it, overall the episode's fine. It's not the greatest episode in the world. It's an entertaining episode. It once again shows like, you know, it's cool to have a, like a, you don't have to have the same characters every week. Uh, we do find out that if you use the ATM or use your de debit card or credit card that, you know, the, the bad guy can find you, which is very stereotypical, atypical type of thing. Uh, and then Benjamin Bratt's character comes into town, tries to find out where she's at. You know, the, the clerk says she's gone west, so like that, trying to deflect, but it's, it's overall just an, it's an entertaining episode. There is some fun moments. 
I do think the Jed character is very stereotypical. So the the only thing that we're the only thing that's really interesting that can kind of ruin this series if it doesn't be careful if it isn't careful is the fact that we learn everything about the murderer. So we're kind of following what happened and who murdered. So we know everything, but Charlie has to uncover everything. So we're kind of one step ahead, but she's able to get there pretty quickly. But it can become problematic because if you know too much, then it might kind of ruin the series a little bit because, you know, the thing about mysteries is the payoff at the end and kind of learning how that works. But there is a level of kind of towing that line where in the, especially in this series where we're given all this information, but there is still stuff that and you'll find this later in like episode three and four where there's information that is played out in that like 16 minutes. But the stuff that Charlie starts to uncover and starts to kind of, you know, put together, it actually makes it quite interesting because we find out new things that we didn't even know or even think about. You know, we get the murder, but there's still things like out there like the lottery ticket or, you know, the iPad, stuff like that, where there are pieces of puzzles that are put together that... You just don't even think about which is kind of cool I, I honestly think that's a really neat trick that still allows the mystery to have some kind of awe-inspiring moments but i think the problem with this episode is it's just too convenient and it's plotting the fact that jed is just too weird and creepy if it had you know a character like i don't know the 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 you know convenience store worker or something like that was the murderer that would have been fine but you're giving us a character that is just a little little too convenient and it's plotting so it's not really the worst thing in the world, but it's like a seven out of ten when I when I, when I go down to the review. But I still enjoyed it. It's still fun. But I think after episode three, I think this is a little more forgettable, to be fairly honest. So that's kind of where I leave at with episode two. But it still has a lot of fun moments. So there you go. And so episode three is called The Stall. It's directed by Ian B. McDonald, written by White Kane. Um, I think this is actually the best of the three episodes, to be fairly honest. And the reason for that is, is I think it has a lot more to say about America and about the situation in America and about, you know, what it's like for greedy people to take over the little man in a lot of respects, because this is an episode that has Lil Rel Howery, has Daniel McDonald and Larry Brown as the kind of main characters for the mystery. Um, basically it's about a barbecue joint in you know wherever charlie's traveling to and in the process uh this character by this is what's so clever about this episode what i love about it is i complained about in episode two about the, the towing the line and about some of the mystery being kind of weird in a lot of respects especially when it comes to the jed character what happens here which is clever is you're not given all the pieces to why the things play out the way they do because we start out with an episode where larry brown's character who runs the barbecue joint is crying he's really upset his wife who's played by daniel mcdonald ask what's going on and he's like i'm a murderer and you're thinking Oh my God, they're giving away the murder already. What did Larry Brown's character do? Well, it's not elaborated on until like 16 minutes into the episode exactly what happens and we'll get to it. But in the process of everything, we're introduced to Lil Rel Howery's character, who of course is the brother of Larry Brown's character. And right off the bat, there's something off about his character, Howery's character. And basically what ends up happening is he thinks his brother his brother basically wants to quit doing this barbecue business because he just feels like it just it's not for him anymore and Laura Howery you know this business is everything to him so in the process of everything um he gives his brother a beer and later on when the the big you know every night they have like a lot of people come because it's a very popular uh, establishment uh Laura Howery's character basically uh comes into the mix he goes to the local radio station, which we'll learn later on, has some really cool uh, concepts and ideas that involve uh, Natasha Leone's character. But in the process, he goes in there, he starts to do his live broad show, his live broadcast, and then he decides he's going to put a uh, USB hard drive and stuff like that into the computer, and he starts playing a uh, recording of whatever, and he just talks for 16 minutes. But with the process, what he's doing, he's hiding his tracks. He actually leaves the building, but before he does, he, he clicks the mute button on the on the mic so people can't hear him leaving. And he goes over and basically uh, kills his brother by uh, hiding all the evidence, washing the bottle out. He, in the process, basically 
uh, hooks a hose. Well, he's trying to hook it to the car, you know, to kill him with carbon monoxide poison and to make it look like a suicide. But everything that happens, he hooks it actually up to um, the stove, the pork, the thing that you cook the meat in and stuff like that. He's also then attacked by a dog. Well, that dog is important later on. And he beats the dog, and we think he kills the dog with the, the piece of wood, which we find out is pecan wood. And he dumps the dog in the middle of the road, and he comes back. He comes back just in time before the, the you know before the recording stops. He starts talking and realizes that he, there's like a small portion of time where he didn't talk, and he forgot that he flipped the, the mute button on, which, like I said, is very important to the later on the episode. Well, this becomes very important because he actually has to clean off the blood with the towel that he uses. He's able to become the, the, the popular guy and stuff like that because people really love him for who he is. And then he hides a little napkin in the dog's tooth in the fire and kind of burns and stuff like that. And then that's when we learn later on that Charlie is traveling down the road. She's uh, at a gas stop. The dog we saw earlier, very aggressive, very mean, uh, kind of rides along with her loves npr loves like the maga radio stations it's very much telling you exactly what you think it's telling you and the dog's a dog's a little strange and she finds herself at the barbecue joint where the dog of course you know eats all the food and she has to kind of work for the company uh in order to pay back the debt of the all food that <laughs> the damn dog ate and basically she becomes friends with larry brown's character who once again is you know i i think he's like kind of just doing things day by day he doesn't feel like he's really impassioned by stuff but what i was talking about earlier with larry brown's character which is really clever is the simple fact that the reason he ends up quitting is not for the simple fact that he's just kind of tired of the whole situation it's because as we found out in the first episode which i didn't talk about uh she uh charlie's character is a woman of uh doing illegal things like selling bootleg dvds or blu-rays or whatever and one of the Blu-rays she has is Oakjaw. And if you know Oakjaw, it's about, you know, the world of animal processing and how, like, disturbing it is and stuff like that. You know, killing animals and whatnot. Well, she gives she gives Larry this video, and this is why Larry's crying. This is why he calls himself a murderer, because of what happens in Oakjaw. And he has a whole, dis he has a whole discussion with uh, Charlie's character about basically quitting the whole world. And this, you know, of course, upsets, you know, the little Rahali's character. And it leads down a road where Charlie is helping out. She, you know, Larry gets killed. She's very upset by it. She starts to uncover clues about, you know, she had been kind of shown like what it's like for why different types of woods are used for different types of meads. So we learn about the pecan wood. She decides she's going to leave because, you know, there's not much else she can do. And in the process of everything, which kind of is cool, she, or not really cool, she actually finds, the, unfortunately, the dog on the side of the road. The dog is still alive, believe it or not, after many, many hours. And she starts to deduct and starts to kind of uncover that there is a conspiracy happening between Lil Rahari's character and Daniel McDonald's character, who are co-conspirating to kill Larry Brown to take over the business, which they are successful at. What they didn't realize is that, you know, Natasha Leone is good at, like, deducting things and she's able to deduce, deduce you know the idea of like the the pecan wood which is actually inside the dog she's able to de de deduce like just all these types of things about like kind of the malfeasance and kind of the idea of like this conspiracy that's going on with little howie and danny mcdonald's character uh she's told to leave she's threatened to be killed but she also had met a she had also met a DJ who's played by Shane uh, Paul McKee, who is the one she's been listening to on the radio. And basically, they're able to uh, use the information at hand to do to expose uh, Lower Howley's character, who is what what is really clever is he basically threatens her. Of course, Charlie's character comes back and is like, "I can expose you," stuff like that. What's also interesting is uh, uh, the the DJ is able to mimic people's voices pretty good, which is a little convenient for what it's worth. He mimics Lil Rahali's uh, character to call Danny McDonald's character to say, we're in trouble, we should turn ourselves in. Danny McDonald basically says, we're not doing that, I'll find a way. And basically she gets <laughs> Lil Rahali's character arrested. But as she's traveling with the police in the car, uh yeah, the DJ unleashes the video or the leashes the audio of what we heard earlier. And this is, I love this little look from the police officer, which she's like, he's first, you know, in a good mood. And then once the information comes out, he's like, he just looks at Daniel McDonald like this. And it's perfect. 
It really is. It's funny. It's entertaining. And it's very hilarious for what it's worth. So with that said, it's a very clever episode with some really interesting, fun, entertaining moments. I love the Oak Job moment because it's just so, it's so perfect for the ideas of what's being presented. And it's just this world that, you know, is very much, you know, a family friendly barbecue joint turns into a murder thing because one brother is very jealous and very upset that his brother wants to shut down the place and he wants to take over the business. So I really like that. I thought it was funny and entertaining. Uh, Lil Ray Howery and Larry Brown, Danny McDonald, and everybody in the, the episode are uh, entertaining. And the dog's perfect because the dog is left behind with the DJ to listen to all the NPR he, <laughs> he wants to make him happy. The poor dog gets beat and then is very angry. It's just, it's a, it's a very funny episode in a lot of respects, but a very serious episode with what his, you know, the material is trying to create. So I give this episode a 9 out of 10. I think it's funny, entertaining, and it's worth a watch. So it's probably the best of the three, er, best of the four episodes. And uh, yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. So there you go. And with that said, let's head into episode four, the last episode to release for this uh, week. Okay, so Rest in Metal is the uh, last episode to release this week, directed by Tiffany Johnson, written by Christine Boylan. Uh, this is an episode that I found fun, but uh, once again, like the second episode, is just a lot of stuff in this episode that it's a little too convenient and it's plotty. But once again, as the reviews say, it's like Columbo, so you kind of have to go with it. And it's just and stuff like that. This episode starts, uh, once again, stars Charlie as, you know, Natasha Lone's character. That's nothing new. Uh, but it also stars Chloe Sevigny uh, as uh, Ruby Rowan. And I like her character because she's very dissuaded, very dis uh, very angry. She's a, she's a rocker of this band called Doxology with these two individuals. They've lost their drummer. She works at a Home Depot. And that it just, it's or not, I don't know if it's Home Depot, but it's like a Home Depot. It's a hardware store. But this is, uh, this this is an individual that had one hit. She's a one-hit wonder. Had a hit called uh, Staplehead. Everybody knows her for it. And she, like I said, is very uh, dissuaded. Just kind of one of those individuals. Well, in the process, she hires a individual named Gavin, who, of course, is played by Nicholas Cirillo. And basically, he's a he's a very what you would call uh, of the type of rocker, where he wears no shoes. He's of that lifestyle. He looks like a very grungy individual, but he seems to really love what he's doing. And she just doesn't seem really happy about it, the, the, the Ruby Ruin character. But they go on a tour. He starts to, Gavin starts to kind of like take over the, uh, he's kind of, his influence is kind of taking over this, uh, this band a little bit, which is not, is kind of getting the ire of not only Ruby, but the other two individuals. But in the process of everything, uh, after like 17 minutes of the episode, cause it's only a 47 minute episode, but after about 17 minutes, uh, they're at, at a concert and in the process of everything, uh, Gavin is electrocuted and dies. And that's kind of the crux of where this episode starts. But there are points where like he creates a song that they steal from him as they kill him. Uh, they burn the note. And uh, it basically leads into, as this ap uh, all these structures of these episodes have done, it goes back to the beginning of the episode where we see that Charlie is basically interviewed by Ruby Ruin to do the merchandise sales, to be the, to do the merchandise sales, to sell the merch for Doxology. And in the process, she basically befriends Gavin because they're so tired of Gavin being in like the, the trailer, the, the, the vehicle with them. And like I said, Doxology is at a point in their career where they're doing like local shows that have like nobody watching them. But basically in the process, uh, Gavin and Charlie become friends and Charlie, you know, starts to see that Gavin's like a truly, he, he loves what he does type of individual. And he sees that, you know, she sees what's happening. And then of course, one night, as we learn, uh, she, uh Charlie watches, unfortunately Gavin get murdered or he sees Ch Gavin get electrocuted. It's ruled as a, an accident. But as we see, she, you know, Charlie and Car starts to uncover, that there may be more to it. She finds the uh, like trash that you know Gavin had you know kind of thrown out everywhere. She kind of uncovers that his song was created through these different packets and different kind of pieces of just like random trash that you know of like food staples and stuff like that. So a packet of sugar might have a per a, a piece of the song on it, which I think is called Sucker Punch or something like that. And basically, it was a, a like a conspiracy to kill him because they wanted to steal the song because they knew it would be a hit. And what's kind of nice is even though Charlie's able to uncover all this through like, you know, Gavin had a, a GoPro camera or the, there was a GoPro camera that was recording the shoes that they were wearing when this electrocution happened and stuff like that. She's able to pinpoint that they stole the, 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 the song 
to become famous again. Everything boils down to they did this to kill. There's all this, like all the equipment that was used, the stapler that Gavin gets hit with, what we try later on, that uh, Charlie actually uses super glue to fix his head because he gets a really nasty cut. All this stuff boils down to is greed and angst and whatever. But Charlie, Charlie isn't able to, you know, get them to expose themselves. She just kind of runs with it. Unfortunately, the Benjamin Bratt character shows up, chases after her. She has to run. But she had met a podcaster earlier, which does murder podcasts like that, which is a really clever moment because it's like that. It's America Life podcast with, you know, the, the very famous podcast that was done. And what's really clever is these three individuals, this doxology group, basically are there. They're at, they play the song. They're at the record deal label, or whatever. Get ready to sign the, the forms, you know, the sheets or whatever. And the, what ends up happening is a song that they use that Gavin created. He took the theme from Benson, which is a, a famous TV show, I think in the 70s or 80s or whatever, and used that as the main kind of crux to the song. But then we also find out that, you know, Charlie had given the, the murder podcast person all this information and that they are exposed to who being the murderers. So therefore they're going to be arrested and they realize they've lost and that Charlie got the upper hand either way, which is really clever. And on top of that, you know, it's just, uh, it's a, it's an entertaining episode with some really good moments. But, but like I said earlier, the stuff that ends up paying off is not the strongest, but you get all this like set up, which is like the longer of the four episodes. But then you find all the incriminating evidence later on, like in every, all four episodes, and that allows these episodes to make more sense, to be more interesting than, like I said, if you have like 16 minutes or 17 minutes of like the murder lead up to the murder and then like you have like nothing to really pay off with it. But the fact that there's stuff still left behind that is able to uncover is still interesting. And that's what happens here is there's still interesting stuff to find out. It's just... I think the main problem is it's just conveniently left in certain areas that it makes it a little too easy to uncover. And I, I think Charlie is a little too smart sometimes for her own good. She can uncover stuff really easily. So there's no real kind of, uh, uh, not really like uh, really difficult. It's like going into a quest on a video game or something like that and having all the pieces just kind of laid there. It's just like, yes, it, it may be a little difficult at first, but most part, it just kind of solves itself pretty easily. And that's what my problem with all four of these episodes is everything is just solved pretty easily. We only have like 47 to an hour uh, long episodes. So and then like 16, 17 minutes are spent on the murder, which I think they could cut that down a little bit. But for the most part, episode four, I would give like, you know, an eight out of 10. It's, it's a good episode with some problems. When it comes to pacing and storytelling, I think, like I said, Chloe Sevigny and the other two actors are really good. You know, it's nice to see Benjamin Bratt come in. Like I said, it's going to play off later on, I'm sure, in the series at some point. Uh, but you, gotta, you have 10 episodes, so you have to kind of spread it out a little bit. But for these first four episodes, yeah, like I said, like uh, I think I gave it like eight, eight and a half out of 10 or what it was. Uh, I think it's good. I think it's good for a good start. And I think it's going to be a fun show. Is it always is it going to be an Oscar or I mean, an Emmy worthy show? Probably not. But I think as uh, as the series moves along, I think it could get stronger and stronger. I think it's just in the first four episodes, you see the you see kind of the the rough around the edges trying to figure out what this show needs to be and what it needs to do all that good stuff so and so with that said that is gonna be my look at the first four episodes and spoiler discussion sense really good show really fun has its problems but i think it's worth watching uh definitely check it out is now released on peacock uh the rest of the series should be released for the next six weeks episode by episode so yeah there you go that's gonna be my take and uh thank you so much for hanging with me on this long video like i said there were chapters so you could go episode by episode or whatever so anyways without further ado thank you so much for watching if you like what you see hit the subscribe button the join movie emporium hit that notification bell top to final is coming next if you like this video awesome hit that like button and as always we'll see you guys on the next video peace out